a sense of self, knowledge which is yearned for by all, but only captured by some. Although many of us know where we come from, who our family members are, and what they did with their lives, very few of us learn to know ourselves in relation to our ancestral backgrounds. This inherent longing, in combination with youthful ambition, perfectly described young Abigail Winter. At 22 years of age, and recently graduated from college, was embarking on a soul-searching journey in the English countryside from her lifelong home of Boston, Massachusetts. Abigail had never been to England before, even though that was where the descendants of her father's side of the family originated from, and she still had family over there. Only a distant aunt and uncle had ever made her acquaintance, back when Abigail was in high school, and they happened to be visiting stateside. She remembered this meeting at a family party when she was only 15, and recalled them both to be very nice people. Ever since then, Abigail secretly romanticized the idea of her English heritage, and vaguely wondered about her English ancestors. Hence why immediately after graduating, she contacted this aunt and uncle to organize a trip to England and learn a little about her family history. That was when the arrangement was made. Unbeknownst to Abigail, a large estate had been in the family for generations, which sat dormant in the countryside. Although no one in the family lived there, a property manager looked after the estate year-round, and it just so happened that he was looking for time off when Abigail reached out. Having mentioned that she wanted to learn more about the family, her aunt and uncle saw this as a perfect opportunity for Abigail to relieve the property manager for a few weeks and explore the family archive which lay untouched at the winter estate, thus bringing her to the very moment she first laid eyes on the luxurious home. The car pulled up through a long gravel driveway, past the front gates and secluded forest area, coming to a halt in front of the enormous house, which sat peacefully in the middle of a grassy field. The driver helped Abigail bring her bags into the house, and made sure she was settled before wishing her a pleasant stay and parting ways. The kitchen and pantry was stocked with enough food and drink to last months, more than necessary for the three weeks Abigail would be there. She unpacked her things and explored the massive dwelling she would call home for the time being. The main rooms, such as the living and dining areas, seemed to make up most of the downstairs. But beyond them, Countless other rooms, nooks, and spaces composed the rest of the house. It was all too much for Abigail to wrap her head around in the first day, so she stayed in the main areas and observed the particular beauty such an old place had to offer. Yes, everything was quite old, from the faded wallpaper to the cracked paint on the dusty fireplace mantel, but the tiny details of each and every facet of the home gave it character and meaning, as if stepping into a time lost and impossible to replicate in today's world. The floral patterns on the crown molding, down to the gorgeous details of the oak ballisters, made Abigail feel like royalty, like this home which existed in her family was some sort of token confirming her importance. She ran her fingers along the walls and wondered about all the things that happened within them. Even though this house was very old and clearly unlived in for generations, the property manager did a good job of keeping things tidy. Still, Abigail cleaned the dust off the mantel and mopped the floors of the main areas. She took pride in cleaning the home as if it were her own. That night, she ate dinner by candlelight and drank wine in the dining room. Her feet pranced playfully as she waltzed across the floor in the arms of an imaginary man who she pictured to be a young, handsome duke ruling over some obscure yet important place. 
Abigail was aware of the silliness in her thoughts, but she didn't care, because at this moment, she was free, and anything was possible. The sun arose and Abigail woke on the living room couch, accompanied by a headache and two empty bottles of wine. She picked them up and brought them to the kitchen. But when she entered, something peculiar caught her eye. The door of the tea cabinet was wide open, exposing all of the cups, plates, and spoons which sat inside. Abigail was puzzled by this, as she knew for a fact that she never opened that cabinet. Although she had no explanation for the open door, paid it no mind and closed it gently. The excitement of exploring the family archive was too much to let anything else cloud her mind while she made her way to the rear of the house. Among the back rooms were a small office, a sewing room, a tea room, and a large study, which held shelves upon shelves of books, along with a closely documented history of the Winter family. The volumes of text containing the family history sat perched on a middle shelf and bearing the winter name, as well as the family crest. Abigail never knew the family had a crest and was immediately drawn to it. A black and gold shield with two dragons on either side and a red ribbon flowing across the top which read, Winter. Abigail proudly opened the first and oldest book, dating back to the mid-1500s. The earliest traceable family member was a man named William White, back then spelled Q-U-H-I-T. He was a Scottish noble who fought against England in the Wars of Independence and was a highly decorated soldier in the Scottish Army. He fathered eight children between two different women who all had unique life stories of their own. The more into her family's lineage Abigail got, the more she wanted to know. And she read incessantly, trying to learn every little thing about each and every person documented in those books. It was in the mid-1600s that the family immigrated to Ireland and changed their name to Wit. In Ireland, Members of the family did all sorts of wonderful things, from publishing books and poetry to running a number of successful businesses, including one of the most popular whiskey distilleries in the whole country. For the entire first week of Abigail's visit, she rarely left the study, aiming to soak in as much of her family history as possible. She read, she ate, she read, she slept and then read some more. With each turning page, the iceberg of knowledge and stories only expanded, leaving Abigail in awe of its vastness. By the mid-1700s, the family's wealth had expanded, and so had they, into English territory, under the name Winter. More notable family members presented themselves, such as Jonathan Winter, a prodigy in chess, earning himself the title of International Grandmaster. Evelyn Winter, renowned seamstress, who went on to design dresses for members of the royal family. And George Winter, a celebrated playwright and beloved member of the London Theatre. Knowing that all of these people were part of her family made Abigail beyond excited. She ached to know who the most recently documented family members were and her connection to them. Having read basically all the books in the family archive, was left with one more, which she took off the shelf and opened eagerly. She read it and found that the last people to live in this very house were Samuel and Eloise Winter, her great uncle and aunt. Samuel was a wildly successful financial investor who harbored the majority of the family's wealth. 
there seemed to be no stable connection between him and the rest of the family, as perhaps the money drove wedges between those who should be dearest. Eloise, his faithful wife, held no occupation and was a member of the church. Beyond that, there was nothing more to be said of her, or Samuel for that matter. And when Abigail turned the page, revealed the rest of the book to be blank, as if the Winter family had simply ended with them. Baffled by confusion, Abigail flipped through the blank pages, but found nothing. In disbelief of her findings, and unsure of what to do next, she got up and went into the living room. Among the walls were a few pictures of Samuel and Eloise, looking poised and formal in each one. In their eyes she saw no life, just blank expressions, and wondered what became of them. Surely they must have had children, but among the walls were only pictures of them and no one else. Abigail decided to get her mind off of her family research for a while. She spent the next few days doing chores around the property and venturing into the town. As much as she tried not to think about her great aunt and uncle, or anyone in her family, Abigail could not deny that the home's atmosphere had changed. Things no longer seemed bright and wondrous, but gloomy and hollow. She couldn't focus on the beautiful possibilities that filled every branch of her family tree. She could only notice the cold, empty spaces that lined the walls of this enormous home. One afternoon, as Abigail sat on the living room floor, putting together a puzzle, she gazed at the open window, letting in sunshine and fresh air. A cool summer breeze came in, and the curtains flowed gently among the sill, hovering softly and perfectly in place. When the breeze stopped, the curtains died down, and as they did, a curious shape was formed by them. Like the veil of a wedding dress, the curtains seemed to rest peacefully on the head of an unseen person becoming more defined as the breeze subsided. In shock of this strange occurrence, Abigail focused intently on what she was seeing. Features began to form where the face would be, and Abigail took notice of the eyes, nose, and mouth. For a brief moment, an expression was clear, before fading into the wind and disappearing with the phantom head altogether. Frightened yet intrigued by what she just saw, Abigail couldn't help but notice the kind of expression held by the invisible face. It was sadness. Sadness in its truest form. And although fright was present in Abigail's heart, that feeling was outweighed by a sense of sorrow. She had to know what happened to her great aunt and uncle Eloise and Samuel so she started searching for clues around the house. She began in the study and found nothing there. She then moved on to the office and checked all of the cabinets and drawers. In the desk, she found a photo album filled with pictures of Eloise and Samuel. These pictures were different to the ones found on display throughout the house. In these pictures, they looked happy as smiles and cheerful expressions adorned their pleasant faces. Abigail began to wonder again about their children, as these pictures contained only them. Towards the end of the album, a clue presented itself. In the pictures of Eloise, a small bump had started to form on her stomach. With the turning of each page, the bump grew bigger, and Eloise's smile grew greater. Samuel was present in many of the pictures as well, with his hands on her now large stomach and his eyes full of joy and happiness. The album ended, and Abigail was left with more questions than answers. Who was this child? Why weren't there any pictures of them? 
and why weren't they in the family archive? Desperate for answers, Abigail searched even harder for something, anything that would bring clarity to the situation. She looked everywhere and every room downstairs, but came up empty. She then moved to the upstairs and rummaged through the countless bedrooms, bathrooms, sitting rooms, and reading rooms. With her hunt for explanation coming to no avail, Abigail was ready to give up and forget about her whole investigation. But just as she was about to go back downstairs, she heard a noise coming from one of the vacant rooms. The wooden creak of a door as it slowly opened by some unseen force. Abigail went toward the sound and found it to be from a small door in one of the reading rooms. She somehow missed it during her frantic search as it sat slightly open upon her arrival. Peering carefully inside, she saw something that made her gasp. In the center of the room, sitting perfectly still, was a wooden baby crib as she opened the door to reveal a nursery. Completely untouched and held in place by the hands of time, sky blue paint graced the walls with puffy white clouds painted along the top edge and ceiling. A toy chest sat against the back wall along with a small dresser in the corner of the room. Abigail looked to find the toy chest empty, but the dresser was not. Infant's clothing filled each drawer, tiny dresses and stockings for a little girl, but also slacks and dress shirts for a little boy. By the way they were folded, it was clear that they had never been worn, and the more articles of clothing she found, the more obsessive the collection seemed. Another door, presumably a closet, sat shut on the opposite wall. Hesitant to see what lay behind it, but unable to help herself, Abigail opened the door. From floor to ceiling, stacks upon stacks of infant's clothes lined the walls. More shirts, pants, stockings, dresses, socks, shoes, hats, and headbands filled up the entire closet, and the neurotic horde of clothing shot distress into Abigail's heart. She jolted out of the closet and away from the nursery, slamming both doors behind her. The sad feelings which had consumed the house were now replaced by alarm and dismay. Abigail couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had happened in this home, and all she wanted was to be away from it. The following days involved Abigail getting out of the house, she spent more and more time in the town and doing some yard work around the property. Anything to get herself away from the home and her mind off of whatever happened there. One day, whilst removing some overgrowth from the side of the house, Abigail noticed a small footpath on the edge of the grassy area leading into the forest. Intrigued by this, she followed it away from the house and disappeared into the trees. At the end of the path lay a small wooden shed, completely run down and covered in foliage. A broken wood door was the only thing between Abigail and the inside of the shed. She pushed it open lightly and stepped inside. Upon first glance, it became clear that the shed was used as a woodworking studio. On the center table and along the side counters lay a number of wooden children's toys, like baby blocks, 
small animals, and even a miniature rocking horse. Again, things meant for a young child, which were clearly never used. Abigail rummaged among the old decrepit shed for anything that might tell more of the story. In the back sat a small wooden desk, with a quill pen sticking up out of an inkwell. Inside one of the desk drawers, Abigail found a leather-bound book with the initials SW pressed into the cover. She looked inside to find a series of dated entries and quickly discovered this book to be the diary of none other than her great uncle Samuel Winter. Ripe with excitement, Abigail ran out of the shed, through the field, and into the house, prepared to read everything written in the book. May 15th, 1894. This home has been overrun with stress, as the pressure to conceive has become too much to bear. I fear Eloise will run herself into an early grave if she does not become a mother. Her only wish in this short life is to have children, and I will do absolutely everything in my power to make it happen. July 29th, 1894. Our struggle to conceive has carried on for far too long. Four years of marriage has felt like a century of heartache and disappointment. I do love Eloise dearly, and with all my heart, but if something does not happen soon, her distress may very well crush us both. September 17, 1894 This unwavering pressure to have children has reached new heights. It has surpassed Eloise and I. And now other members of the family are coming forward, asking about arrangements with my wealth in the event a child is not born. Even my own brother, suggesting I find a young mistress to impregnate, simply to ward off the troves of distant relatives who may seek a piece of my fortune when I die. Is there no compassion in this family? Is money the only thing people care about? December 6th, 1894. Today is a most joyous day in our big empty home. God has smiled upon us and blessed Eloise with the gift of life. Finally there is warmth in this house and we can now start the family we have always wanted. I have never been so happy in all my life. February 21st, 1895. Eloise has begun to show in her stomach and the first visible sign of our new child brings me so much joy. Ever since the news of Eloise's pregnancy, I have been hard at work building furniture and toys for the nursery. I count the days until I can see the baby asleep in its crib, sitting on its rocking horse and taking its first steps. A life of fatherhood is one I welcome with open arms. May 10th 1895. Eloise's stomach has now gotten quite big, and the doctor says everything is good and normal. The happiness in her eyes makes me proud to be her husband, and her excitement for motherhood can't be contained either. She has sewn enough garments to clothe an entire nation of infants. We've even come up with names. Judith for a girl, and Joseph for a boy. The baby is expected in early August, and neither of us can wait for the blessed day. June 1st, 1895. Today, a most horrible thing has happened. Early this morning, Eloise awoke to unbearable pains in her stomach, and when she got up to go to the washroom, felt the warm sensation of blood run down her legs and onto the floor. The doctor arrived shortly after and announced to us that the baby was lost. The shriek which came from Eloise's mouth is one I will never forget, and the tears which came after I'm afraid will never end. 
Why must God be so cruel as to give us the hope we have always yearned for, just to take it away at the last moment? I fear this tragedy is one we may never recover from. August 10th, 1895. Once again, our house is cold. Void of happiness or anything which brings joy. Stress has returned. And again, life has become a frantic mess. Family have come forward to offer their condolences, as well as financial advice, neither of which I care for. Eloise's grief has turned her into a blank slate, and I worry for her greatly. October 11th, 1895. Our relentless attempts at conception have continued to prove unsuccessful. Eloise has begun to lose hope, and so have I. May 25th, 1896. Reasons to continue on this path to parenthood are dwindling, as it seems the journey will never end. Eloise has lost all passion for living. Her attitude has become quite contagious. December 31st, 1897. The past two years have been full of nothing but sorrow and misery. Eloise can no longer look me in the eyes. Her silence holds a tight grip around my heart. She has expressed her willingness to end this nightmare. And tonight we shall. There is no reason to go on like this. That was the final passage in the notebook, with the last pages being left blank. Samuel's concluding message put a harrowing sensation in Abigail's bones, as the fate of her great aunt and uncle was clearly more grim than she had imagined. That night, Abigail went to sleep in the master bedroom. Another layer of sadness shrouded the home, and it was apparent that these walls had experienced much. She had trouble falling asleep, as she tossed and turned for hours in the bed, unable to rest or relax. Late into the night, the bedroom door slowly crept open, and a presence entered the room. She felt it immediately, and all the hair on her body stood up straight. This presence crept along the floor and toward the bed. It ran up by the headboard and hovered just above Abigail. She was completely aware of everything that was happening and sensed the cold spirit floating right over her body. Fright did not overtake Abigail in this moment, even though she felt as if she should be terrified. Deep sadness and pain took its place as the calm spirit focused intently on Abigail. She knew intuitively that this spirit was that of Eloise Winter, and that it came to speak to her communicating in a language not bound by words. The celestial message conveyed by Eloise gave Abigail new perspective, and the spirit slowly drifted toward the window. Abigail opened her eyes and was drawn at once to the window, as if being summoned silently by something outside. She looked out, to find a ghostly white woman at the edge of the grassy field. It was none other than her great aunt, Eloise Winter, beckoning her to follow. Abigail went outside and walked across the field, with dewy grass gracing the bottoms of her feet as she did so. Before reaching the edge of the field, Eloise's spirit began walking down the path which led to the shed. Abigail hurried to follow, as she continued past the shed and deeper into the woods. 
Further down the path was a small clearing, and by the time Abigail reached it, the spirit was gone. In the clearing sat two headstones, Samuel and Eloise Winter, date of death on both stones being December 31st, 1897. Abigail wept to see those two names side by side, knowing how difficult their final years were. Her heart broke as tears rolled down her face, and the intrinsic wonder of her family history was shattered by the cruelness of reality. The next day was Abigail's last at the estate. She made it a point to find out exactly what happened to her great aunt and uncle. She went to the library and asked if they had any local newspaper articles from 1897 or 1898. She then mentioned Samuel and Eloise Winter, and the old librarian knew exactly what she came looking for. Read for yourself, she said, and Abigail did. The film roll contained a local newspaper, dated January 2nd, 1898. The headline on the front page read, Couple Found Dead at Winter Estate. The article detailed how the two were found side by side in the master bedroom, holding hands after taking a lethal dose of morphine. This was clearly an event which shook the local community but not in the ways it should have. Most of the article consisted of what was to happen to Samuel's vast fortune and assets, which Abigail learned was divided fairly evenly among the other family members. It seemed that the focus of everyone's attention was on Samuel's wealth, and not the personal struggle him and Eloise endured. It became clear that the family archive ended with Samuel and Eloise, not because the family ended, but because everyone lost interest when they got his money. Some of the Winters stayed in England, while others went abroad, to places like Australia and America. It seemed that what they had gained in financial means, they had lost in family identity and became fragmented as a result. Abigail went back to the estate for her final night there and dwelt on all the information she had gathered during this time. She felt proud to be a winter, proud of her family's greatest achievements, and saddened by their harshest downfalls. It was all quite much to process, how her family history managed to influence her so greatly but also how little of an effect these momentous events would have on her life. Abigail went to sleep that night in the master bedroom, unafraid of what ghosts may be stirring from the past. She closed her eyes and felt peace in her heart, no longer entranced by whatever came before, but optimistic about everything that was to come next. Daylight flooded every room of the grand winter home as the driver pulled up to fetch Abigail and bring her away. He helped put her bags in the car and they drove off down the long gravel driveway. Abigail looked back and gazed across the grassy field at the large empty house, getting smaller and smaller. She said goodbye and thank you to the beautiful estate as they drove through the short wooded area and out the front gate. Abigail was glad to know her family history and respected the story of each and every ancestor, but decided right in that moment she would no longer dwell on the past and she would write her own narrative, one that she would be proud of, regardless of its obstacles or obscurity. Abigail Winter was her name, and this was the beginning of her story. <laughs>